Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is September 30, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 50. Forty years ago this month World War II began. On September 1, 1939, the German war machine of Adolf Hitler began the Blitzkrieg against Poland. Soon all Europe was aflame with war. The flames soon spread to engulf the United States, Japan, and much of Asia. In the nearly six years that it lasted, World War II took an estimated 35 million lives. About half of those killed were civilians, men, women, and children. But whether they were in uniform or not, very few of those who suffered and died had any real idea why. The forces that led to World War II were set in motion in secrecy. Then the war itself intensified the secrecy on all sides. Secrecy in diplomacy, secrecy in planning military campaigns, secrecy in developing new weapons, and, my friends, it was a secret weapon that finally ended the war in the Pacific. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped in war. It was dropped by a nation which thought of itself as a Christian nation the United States of America, and the city which was chosen to be the first victim had one of the largest Christian communities in Japan, Hiroshima. One might have asked, why are the Christians of America killing the Christians of Hiroshima with the world's first nuclear attack? But of all the questions which have been asked about Hiroshima during the past 34 years, that question has been asked the least, if at all. Everyone knows this was war. Hiroshima was considered a major military target, and so, Christians or no Christians, Hiroshima was attacked. Today I'm often asked, if Russia's new rulers of today really are Christians, why are they willing to kill people? And why are they willing to do things which may cause even Christians to be killed? The answer today is the same as it was in World War II. This is war. But today, after four decades of increasing secrecy, war itself is secret. Not only do we not know the reasons for war, we do not even know certain kinds of warfare are taking place. The most important military and political developments today are parts of a secret war in which the United States is now the prime battleground. The battle is between the new Christian rulers of Russia and their bitter enemies. These enemies are the overthrown Bolsheviks and their close relatives, the Zionists. The Kremlin of today is trying above all to prevent their enemies from igniting nuclear war. Last spring, as I revealed in AUDIO LETTERS 45 and 46, the Russians began seizing control of the United States Government. Key officials from President Jimmy Carter on down have been replaced by doubles, and these doubles are not human beings in spite of their appearance and behavior. They are artificial, robot-like living beings called organic robotoids. When I first revealed these things, I braced myself. I knew that many of my listeners would be unable to absorb them, but my reason for doing it was the one I stated then. Without knowing about the robotoids, events would become impossible to understand. Since that time, robotoids in key positions of power have been causing many surprises in the news these days. The strangest surprises of all have been caused by the Jimmy Carter robotoids. In AUDIO LETTER No. 48 two months ago, I detailed the major instability problems the Russians are having with their Carter Robotoids. The holographic computer brains of the Robotoids include instabilities which were present in the real Carter brain in a way that exaggerates those instabilities. As a result, ever so often a Carter Robotoid does something so unpredictable that it is dangerous to the Russians. An example was the famous so-called Killer Rabbit incident of a few weeks ago. A Carter Robotoid told the press, in all seriousness, that he and his family had been attacked by a swamp rabbit while fishing. Can you imagine? 
The Russians want to rid themselves of the nerve-wracking problem of the unstable Carter Robotoids. Earlier this month, on September 15, an attempt was made to do just that. The alleged President Carter was entered in a foot race, of all things, in the Catoctin Mountains near Camp David. It was a strenuous six-mile course which included much uphill running. Carter Robotoid No. 14 was programmed to run at maximum speed and not to let up for any reason. The Russian strategy was simple. Runners who overexert themselves and who do not stop and rest when danger signs appear can do themselves serious harm. Sudden overheating, dehydration, and heart failure can take place abruptly in extreme cases. Robotoids, as I have explained in past tapes, embody a crude facsimile of human metabolism. Their hearts are relatively weak, and they live for only a few weeks or months depending on the stress problems. They have no self-preservation instinct, so Carter Robotoid 14 was programmed to run like the wind. It was expected that suddenly, without warning, he would suffer complete heart failure, collapse, and die on the spot. If the Robotoid died before aid could reach him, everyone would just accept it as a tragic accident, and the Russians would be rid of the problem of unstable Carter Robotoids. But the day of the race dawned cooler than it had been expected by the planners. Carter Robotoid 14 did collapse, but did not expire instantly. His face turned a deathly greenish-gray, and he was moaning and incoherent, and yet when the Secret Service men picked him up, his legs kept running as programmed. Finally an ambulance arrived, but Carter Robotoid 14 did not use it. Instead, the Robotoid was bundled off in a car to Camp David, and there Robotoid 14 finally died, too late and out of public view. The purpose of the race had been to eliminate the Carter Robotoid problem in a way that would leave no questions, that is, sudden death on the spot. But there would have been a storm of questions if Carter's alleged death had been announced after help arrived and took him away. So after the race, Carter Robotoid No. 15 showed up to reassure everyone. He looked nothing at all like the deathly figure who had clapped just a short while earlier in the race. He looked like a new man, and in a sense he was. The contrast between the dying Robotoid 14 and the fresh Robotoid 15 is something you can see for yourself. Just get a copy of Sports Illustrated magazine for September 24, 1979. On pages 16 and 17 you will see the pictures of Robotoid 14, stricken, stumbling, mouth agape. Then look at the fresh, smiling picture of Robotoid 15 handing out trophies on page 19 only a short while later, and then ask yourself, is this the same man? My friends, the Robotoids are one example of what you need to know to understand the secret war now going on, but there are other things you need to know too, because the war between Russia and her Bolshevik and Zionist enemies has many facets, and it is very ancient. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, Runaway Inflation and the Collapsing American Economy. Topic No. 2, The Cuban Crisis to Destroy SALT II. And Topic No. 3, The Thousand-Year War Between Russia and the Khazars. Topic No. 1. To most Americans, the most worrisome headlines these days are probably those about our weakening economy. By comparison, most other major news events may seem remote and less important to us. SALT II, troops in Cuba, and arguments between blacks and Jews may disturb us, but they hardly seem to touch most of us personally. The economy is another matter. We all have to keep food on the table, clothing on our backs, and a roof over our heads, and it's becoming harder by the day to do these things. Hardly a day seems to pass without some new item of bad news about the economy. One day the Federal Reserve System announces that it's raising its own interest rates to member banks to an all-time record level. Another day, leading banks raise their interest rates to their best customers to levels which also set new records. With each increase, young couples wanting to buy their own homes find it more and more impossible to do so. For them, 
The American dream of a home of their own is fading into a fantasy. They are watching helpless as their fondest hopes explode in the tornado of rising consumer prices and runaway interest rates. But somehow, my friends, it turns out to be only the average working man and woman who are being priced out of borrowing the money they need. By contrast, business loans are increasing fast instead of dropping off. Many businessmen are borrowing all they can get regardless of interest rates. They are pouring their dollars into plant and equipment, building up inventories, and in some cases speculating in foreign currencies and gold. And so while you and I are being squeezed out, big business is borrowing dollars like they are going out of style. Because my friends, the dollar is going out of style. They are expecting to repay their loans later on with dollars that are almost worthless. Meanwhile, the bad economic news goes on. One day we're told that unemployment is up. Not good, we think, especially if we happen to be among the unemployed. But at least this ought to start bringing down inflation, according to most all the experts. For years they have always told us that, but no, inflation keeps speeding up too. We know it is every time we buy groceries. Next we hear that productivity is dropping off in the United States. According to government figures released last month, productivity was plunging at the fastest rate in five years by last spring. That means America's economy is becoming less and less efficient and more and more service-oriented. If that is so, we wonder how can we compete in world markets. Then someone mentions that what is happening to the United States economy is called stagflation. Our economy is stagnating, and yet inflation is heating up. Again we scratch our heads. This is something new to us in America. In the past we have had recessions and we have had inflation, but not together. Now we have both at once, and where is it all leading? One clue to where it is leading is contained in other figures released by the Labor Department last month. Last spring hourly compensation measured in dollars was rising. People were receiving the increases in pay at a rate of about 8% a year in dollars, but inflation is now outrunning these pay increases. As a result, real compensation in terms of what you can buy with your money, drop 5% during the spring quarter, so our paychecks may look bigger and bigger, but on the average they're able to buy less and less. The sliding value of the dollar at the grocery store is reflected also on the international monetary scene. Overseas, holders of dollars are unloading them as fast as they can before they can shrink to nothing. Dollars are being traded for hard currencies like the West German Deutsche Mark. The shift is massive. A few days ago on September 20 there was an effective devaluation of the dollar against the mark by about 2%. Dollars are also being traded so fast for gold that the trading has been called frenzied. That is why the price of gold in United States dollar is soaring to incredible levels. Just two days ago it passed $400 an ounce for the first time in history. My friends, our growing economic woes are the fruits of deliberate planning by very powerful men. I made much of this plan public nearly seven years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published by George Braziller in New York, New York. Now that the things I have described there are happening, my book is out of print. But at that time most of my readers simply could not believe that these things could really happen. And so even though I identified many of the people responsible, nothing at all was done to stop the plan. A year later, in the spring of 1974, I revealed in Congressional testimony that most of America's Let's Gold hoard was gone. It was a key ingredient in the plan to destroy the United States economy on the way to dictatorship. I stood ready to back up my charges with evidence and witnesses, but Congress did nothing. So I went public with my charges. Public pressure finally led to the so-called Gold Inspection Visit to Fort Knox by a Congressman and newsman in September 1974. It was a fraud and touched off many questions and suspicions in the foreign press. But here at home the fraud worked and people calmed down about Fort Knox. 
nothing lasting was done, and the plan for America's economic collapse continued. The fall of 1974 I began recording talking tapes. My very first tape, Audio Book No. 1, was recorded five years ago next month. That tape included information which my listeners could use as a starting point in their own personal planning for the events to come. I did not give financial advice as such, but I did describe the kind of things which historically have been useful under adverse economic conditions. Today. Many of those conditions are developing all around us. Early in 1975 I recorded a second tape, Audio Book No. 2, about the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. In that tape I gave more details about the secret disappearance of America's former gold hoard. I also gave more details about the economic and political upheavals which were being planned for America's future. In those tapes I gave the best information then available to me, but I made the mistake of revealing an approximate timetable for coming events as they were then being planned. I stated clearly that these were purely the plans and schedules of men. My hope in revealing those plans was that by doing so I could contribute in some small way to delaying or even stopping them. My intentions in making public the secret timetables, which were plans, not prophecies, were sadly misunderstood by some. I have actually been condemned by some people because World War III did not take place on schedule. Can you imagine? Even so, the confidential sources who gave me that information which I revealed four and five years ago knew what they were talking about. For example, in those early tapes I revealed the plans of the late David Rockefeller and his intimates for gold to reach $2,000 an ounce. At that time it sounded ridiculous to many people. Even $200 an ounce sounded like too high a price for gold to reach more than temporarily, but today gold has already established a new record of at least $400 an ounce. The old conventional wisdom is in the wastebasket. The so-called gold bugs of only a few years ago have turned out to be too conservative. Whether gold will still reach $2,000 an ounce as originally planned remains to be seen. After all, the real David Rockefeller has been dead now for seven months since February 1979. Even so, the basic economic forces which he and his collaborators unleashed now have tremendous momentum. The total collapse of the United States dollar, and with it our economy, is now only a matter of time. There is an historical precedent for what is happening to us, my friends. It happened in Germany in the early 1920s. It was a case of superinflation leading to disintegration of the economy. The seeds of disaster were planted in July 1914 at the outbreak of World War I. The German Government did not want to provoke opposition to the war by imposing heavy taxes, so instead the redeemability of the mark in gold was suspended. Then the Government began borrowing to finance the war without any limit on the amount of money that could be printed. In the same way, the process of divorcing the dollar from its gold backing began during World War II. In 1945, the gold backing was reduced from 42% to 25%. Then in March 1968 Congress quietly removed the last remaining gold backing of 25%. That meant the printing presses were free to roll. Finally on August 15, 1971, President Nixon finished the job of untying the dollar from gold. He slammed the international gold window saying that the United States would no longer redeem dollars with gold in international dealings. What he did not say was that most all of America's alleged gold hoard was gone by then. The German Government's action in cutting the mark loose from gold in 1914 triggered the accumulation of currency during the war. After the war ended, people began spending their stored up marks, and inflation took off, and in the same way after Nixon closed the gold window in the United States, the prices for international commodities began to zoom upward, and gold followed suit. 
As the German inflation accelerated, the German Central Bank tried to support the mark in the international exchange markets. Every time the mark would start sliding relative to other currencies, the Reichsbank would buy marks using their own reserves of foreign currencies. It's the same today, my friends. Whenever the dollar starts tumbling, we hear that the Federal Reserve, our privately owned central bank, is supporting the dollar. Sometimes the key word used is that the Federal Reserve Bank is intervening on behalf of the dollar. Either way, it means the Fed is throwing away hard foreign currencies to buy up sick dollars on foreign markets. In other words, throwing good money after bad. The Rights Bank also tried to support the mark by giving gold for marks, not at home but in the international money markets. The parallel to this today is the series of gold auctions by the United States Treasury. The Treasury keeps these auctions as small as possible because there is no huge gold hoard left to back up the dollar. Instead, there is a secret scramble going on continuously to scrape together gold from various sources to auction off. The gold is sold in the words of the GSA invitations to bid, as is, quote unquote. There are no guarantees and the gold offered is highly impure instead of what is called good delivery gold. Even so, buyers gladly exchange their shriveling dollars for the Treasury gold scraps. For a while the German inflation gave the appearance of stimulating business, but this was because no one wanted to hold on to marks that were losing their value. Instead, the money was spent, traded for goods of all kinds which would not lose their value. But this was a self-defeating process. As people became more anxious to get rid of marks, they became less eager to accept them. As a result, prices climbed ever more steeply. Organized workers and unions managed to win pay raises, but not fast enough to keep up. Unorganized workers and those on fixed incomes were left behind altogether. Wages and marks rose, but real wages began to drop. This is the very thing which is now happening here in the United States. Germans who earned a living by legitimate work of all kinds began to slip downward in their standard of living. The point was reached where speculation in gold and commodities was the only way to keep up with inflation. There are obvious parallels today. In recent years, investors have increasingly shifted their attentions to the commodity exchanges while the stock market wanders in the doldrums. As for gold, who doesn't know about gold these days? The German inflation reached the point where it fed on itself. It was no longer a question of basic economics. It was a question of confidence. People lost all confidence in the mark, and from that point on the presses literally could not print marks fast enough. By the middle of 1923, men were paid as often as three times a day. Their wives would meet them and hurry off to spend the money before it could depreciate still further. The point was reached where doing business in this way became impossible. Men would not work for money that was worthless before they could spend it. Farmers would not trade food for paper that would buy nothing. Businesses started closing. Food riots erupted. The German economy started falling apart at the seams. The German superinflation was eventually stopped in the same way that it is always used when a currency collapses. A new currency is introduced to replace the old one. In Germany it was called the Rettenmark, and it was backed up by pledges that restored confidence. Here in the United States our replacement currency has already been printed for initial distribution when the time comes. We will trade many old dollars for each new dollar, but even the new dollar will not be backed by gold because we have almost no gold for that purpose. Instead, it will be a garrison dollar usable only within the United States, unacceptable in other countries. In AUDIO BOOK 1 five years ago, I explained that those who were putting these forces in motion were declaring war on us, the American people. The four Rockefeller brothers were hoping to end up as our absolute dictators on the way to conquering the whole world. Now. 
The Bolsheviks here in America are trying to take advantage of the economic forces which they helped the Rockefellers set in motion. The Rockefellers were aiming for a complete corporate socialism takeover, whereas the Bolsheviks want a new Bolshevik revolution and a brutal state socialism takeover. The Russians, meanwhile, are using their robotoids in key positions in an effort to thwart the Bolshevik design here in America. The Russians did not create the forces leading to our economic collapse, but neither are they trying to stop them. Instead, they are attempting to guide the process of economic collapse here in such a way that it will backfire on the Bolsheviks. Seven years ago, five years ago, even three years ago, we the American people might have acted to undo the forces leading to collapse. We could have demanded that our gold be brought back to Fort Knox, that those who took it be punished, and that the dollar be good as gold once again. But we, as a people, did nothing at all. It was far easier to accept official lies than the unofficial truth. So now our land has become an economic battleground in a war between the Russian Christians and their ancient enemies. It remains to be seen who will win that war, but either way millions of Americans are going to lose and to suffer. Topic No. 2. Late last month, on the evening of August 30, another of our never-ending crises began. News wires crackled with ominous words from the Idaho home of Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Frank Church. He was quoted as saying that American intelligence had confirmed the presence of Russian combat troops in Cuba, and breaking with his past behavior, he surprised everyone. He demanded the immediate withdrawal of all Russian combat troops from Cuba. What's going on, my friends, is another skirmish, a major one, between the Bolsheviks and the Christian rulers of Russia. The Bolsheviks in our government here in America are following a strategy now which has important similarities to their Guyana strategy of last November 1978. There's not enough time for me to review all the details of what happened then. For those details you may want to refresh your memory by listening again to AUDIO LETTER No. 40, but for now let me just remind you that last November the Bolsheviks used tensions over Cuba as a part of a larger strategy. The same thing is happening again now, but this time there is an important difference. Using their robotoids, the Russians are succeeding so far in staying one step ahead of the Bolsheviks. Last time the real target was not Cuba, but the secret Russian missile base in Guyana. This time the primary target again is not Cuba, but the SALT II Treaty. And yet, just as before, the Russians do not dare lower their guard around Cuba or anywhere else because the Bolsheviks here will lash out wherever they can find an opening anywhere in the world. Last time the artificial Bolshevik crisis over Cuba was built around MiG-23s. This time it is Russian ground combat troops. 3,000 Russian troops could no more attack the United States from Cuba today than the MiG-23s could have attacked last year. What's more, the Bolsheviks here are using old information about Russian troops now, just as they used old information about MiG-23s last year. The alleged spy satellite pictures of Russian troops in Cuba were not obtained last month as claimed. Regardless of what Robotoid Carter says tomorrow night on television, the pictures are actually almost two years old, obtained in late 1977. Two years ago this month, on September 27, 1977, the United States lost the most decisive battle of the 20th century to Russia. It was history's first space battle, the Battle of the Harvest Moon. I reported it that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, but it has never been reported to the public officially. Following that battle, the United States and Russia were on the brink of war. 
The Russians were pressuring our own rulers behind the scenes to abandon their plans for conquest by nuclear war. America step-by-step -step surrender by unilateral disarmament under SALT II was demanded by the Russians. Meanwhile, Russia's newly operational Cosmos interceptors had begun systematically destroying America's space fleet of spy satellites. The Cosmos interceptors, which are manned and armed with particle beam weapons, were seeking out and blasting our spy satellites one by one. The United States has no defense against the Cosmos interceptors, but the process of eliminating all our spy satellites was a gradual one, taking several months to complete. By April 1978 they were all gone, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. But in the meantime the CIA turned on all of our spy satellites. The idea was to gather as much information as possible worldwide before they were destroyed. Normally they are only turned on selectively in order to extend their operating life, but with Russian Cosmos interceptors blasting them into fireballs one after another, that no longer mattered. One of the things picked up by the satellites in their dying days late 1977 were Russian maneuvers in Cuba. The maneuvers were taking place in brigade strength, which was puzzling. The Russian Army normally does not use the brigade as a unit of organization. It only made sense later on when it was learned that Soviet troops, mostly from Asia, were being infiltrated into Canada and Mexico. This is in preparation for possible invasion of the United States across our northern and southern borders, as I reported long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 32. The troops are entering Canada through the province of Quebec as part of an arrangement, a secret arrangement, between Russia and France. In Mexico they are entering through the Yucatan Peninsula. French influence is also great in Mexico although this is less well known here in the United States. Cuba is the key way station for the troops, whether headed for Canada or Mexico. In AUDIO LETTER No. 32 I explained the manner in which the Russian troops are remaining dispersed and therefore undetected in Canada and Mexico, but when and if the order to invade the United States is given, they are to form up quickly into organized fighting forces. In planning this strategy, the Russian generals concluded that the optimum organizational unit would be the Brigade, and so when the troops arrive in Cuba they are trained in Brigade-sized maneuvers. Then they disband and are injected into Quebec and the Yucatan Peninsula. So the Bolsheviks here in the government, in charging that there is a Brigade of Russian troops in Cuba, are telling such a small fragment of the truth that it amounts to a lie. They dare not tell the whole truth because that would open up questions about our non-existent spy satellites. Even so, the Bolsheviks have calculated cleverly. The Russians have no way in which they can defend themselves by explaining what is really going on because no one would understand. So it is once again a battle of maneuver and intrigue. My friends, when the SALT II Treaty was signed in Vienna three months ago, I alerted you to be on the lookout for certain things. At that time there was great publicity that SALT II was in trouble in the Senate, but as I told you then in AUDIO LETTER No. 47, the Russians were replacing key Bolshevik agents in the Senate with their own robotoids. As a result, I was able to tell you to watch for opposition to SALT II to gradually fade away, and through the rest of the summer that is exactly what was happening. SALT II prospects were getting better by the day. Even so, I also cautioned in AUDIO LETTER No. 47 that, quote, there remains a slim chance that the Bolsheviks will somehow find a way to upset SALT II, unquote, and also, quote, the ratification of SALT II could be the litmus test that will decide between peace and war for America and Russia." Unquote. These are the stakes in the struggle now over Russian troops in Cuba. It began in mid-July. 
Bolshevik sources began feeding carefully fabricated tips about Russian troops in Cuba to Florida Senator Richard Stone. Stone then brought it up during the SALT II hearings by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. During testimony by the Secretary of Defense, Robotoid Harold Brown, Stone unexpectedly asked about a Soviet combat brigade in Cuba. Robotoid Brown had not yet been programmed for that question and was puzzled. But Robotoid Senator Frank Church, the Chairman of the Committee, jumped into the discussion. Between them, the two Russian Robotoids, Brown and Church, diffused the issue temporarily. Robotoid Brown authorized Robotoid Church to issue a comforting statement to the press. It denied that Cuba harbored a Russian military presence other than advisors. But now the Russians knew what the Bolsheviks were going to use for their manufactured anti-SALT II crisis. They knew they could not stop the Bolsheviks from somehow breaking it into the open, so they played for time. Every additional day made the SALT II Treaty just a little more secure. Meanwhile, using their robotoids in key positions, the Russians stayed alert for the next Bolshevik move. In mid-August, the Russian KGB learned about the ploy being cooked up by the Bolsheviks within the CIA. The robotoid replacement for CIA Director Stansfield Turner had learned about the intended use of the two-year-old satellite pictures of Russian troops in Cuba. The Russians braced themselves. They also programmed the Frank Church Robotoid to take the initiative on Cuba the moment he was told anything about alleged recent satellite pictures of Cuba. On August 30, the Church Robotoid was among those who were informed about the supposedly new satellite pictures. As programmed, he swung into action immediately. In Idaho for the Labor Day recess, the Church Robotoid summoned reporters for a news conference. There he made the announcement and hardline statements which launched the present crisis. By taking such a hardline position, the Church Robotoid surprised everyone. Fellow Senators raised their eyebrows in astonishment, and so did many members of the press. But it was a clever and unexpected move by the Russians, because in this way the Russians took the ball away from the Bolsheviks. Senator Stone, who had started the whole thing, was left no room to be more hawkish than Church. And since Church is the Chairman of the Committee while Stone is only a member, everyone promptly forgot about Stone. Now when the conditions are right, Robotoid Church will be in command of the situation. Having been the hardest of the hardliners, he will have credibility if he later announces, I am satisfied. The Cuban situation is now resolved, so let us proceed with SALT II. That is the outcome which the Russians are striving for. Meanwhile the Russians are using their robotoids in the Senate to delay a vote on SALT II. This is a move to save the treaty which would be defeated if a vote were taken right now. Meanwhile very dangerous and intricate maneuverings are continuing on both sides. The Russians are still having difficulties with their robotoids and are having to introduce them more slowly than planned. At the same time, the Bolsheviks are beginning to regroup and regain some strength. As a result, the risk of nuclear war is beginning to rise again. The danger is still far less than it was at this time last year, but it is growing. In fact, as of this moment, a military war of nerves is secretly in progress between Russia and the United States. Three nights ago the National Security Council held one meeting after another in this war of nerves. The meetings began the evening of September 27, the second anniversary of the Battle of the Harvest Moon, and they continued long through the night. Russian Robotoids in the Council were working overtime to keep the lid on the situation. Meanwhile, my friends, there are presently about 500 Russian submarines in positions for possible attack around the United States. About 200 are lined up along our east coast, while 150 are stationed along the west coast, and roughly the same number along our Gulf Coast. Of course the Russians do not have to depend on their submarines if they ever decide to actually attack, 
For three years now Russian short-range underwater launch missiles have been planted within our own territorial waters, and for more than two years Russian hydrogen bombs have been planted at their targets throughout the United States. These range from tiny micro-nukes to giant dam busters. Finally, the Russians also have their space triad of weapons, for which we have no equivalent. One leg of their space triad consists of the Cosmos Interceptors, which I referred to earlier. Another leg is on the Moon, where Russian Particle Beam weapons have been stationed for nearly two years, and the third leg is their fleet of Cosmospheres, which are floating high above our cities in military sites. But as of now, the Russians do not wish to attack. Their actual goal is the opposite. It is called deterrence. They are using their submarine deployment to send a message to the Bolsheviks here in America. In particular, the Russian subs are deployed with special emphasis on the southeastern United States, reflecting their concern for Cuba. That emphasis consists of missile submarines known to be armed with neutron warheads. Neutron weapons, my friends, are the most usable of all nuclear weapons because they produce essentially no fallout. So by deploying them, the Russians are warning the Bolsheviks, if you strike, so will we. Topic No. 3 Over the past two years or so, I have discussed the struggle within Russia between the Christians and the Bolsheviks since 1917. Current events cannot be understood without knowing about the past six decades of struggle for control of the Kremlin, but that struggle in turn is part of an even bigger historical picture. What we are seeing today, my friends, is the climax of a war of more than a thousand years between the two most bitter enemies on earth. It is the war between Russia and the Khazars. The Kingdom of the Khazars vanished from the map of the world many centuries ago. Today many people have never even heard of it, yet in its day the Khazar Kingdom was a very major power indeed, holding sway over a large empire of subjugated peoples. It had to be reckoned with by the two neighboring superpowers of that day. To the south and west of Khazaria the Byzantine Empire was in full flower with its Eastern Orthodox Christian civilization. To the southeast the Khazar Kingdom bordered on the expanding Moslem Empire of the Arab Caliphs. The Khazars influenced the histories of both of these other empires, but far more importantly the Khazar Kingdom occupied what was later to become a southern portion of Russia between the Black and Caspian Seas. As a result, the historical destinies of the Russians and the Khazars became intertwined in ways which have persisted down to the present day. In case you have never heard of the Khazars, I think I should mention where you can look to learn more about them. Three years ago, in 1976, a book about the Khazars was published by the British writer Arthur Kessler. The book is titled The Thirteenth Tribe. The Khazar Empire and its Heritage. The American publisher is Random House, New York, New York. History records that the Khazars were derived from a mixture of Mongols, Turks, and Finns. As early as the 3rd century A.D. they were identifiable in constant warfare in the areas of Persia and Armenia. Later in the 5th century the Khazars were among the devastating hordes of Attila the Hun. Around 550 A.D. the nomadic Khazars began settling themselves in the area around the Northern Caucasus between the Black and Caspian Seas. The Khazar capital of Etil was established at the mouth of the Volga River where it emptied into the Caspian in order to control the river traffic. The Khazars then exacted a toll of 10 percent on any and all cargo which passed Etil on the river. Those who refused were attacked and slaughtered. With their kingdom firmly established in the Caucasus, the Khazars gradually began to create an empire of subjugated peoples. More and more Slavonic tribes, who were peaceful compared to the Khazars, were attacked and conquered. They became parts of the Khazar Empire, required to pay tribute continually 
to the Khazar Kingdom. Tribute by conquered peoples has always been a feature of empires, of course, but not in the fashion of the Khazars. The so-called great empires of the world always gave something in return for the tribute they exacted. Rome, for example, made citizens of those they conquered, and in return for the taxes they levied they brought civilization, order, and protection against attack from would-be invaders, but not so in the Khazar Empire. The peoples who were subject to the Khazars received only one thing in return for their payments of tribute, and that was a shaky promise. The Khazars would refrain from further attacks and pillage so long as the tributes were paid. The subjects of the Khazar Empire, therefore, were nothing more than the victims of a giant protection racket. The Khazar overlords were therefore resented universally and bitterly throughout their domain, but they were also feared because of the merciless way in which they dealt with anyone who stood up to them, and so the Khazar Empire expanded until it occupied large areas of what is now Russia and southeastern Europe. By the 8th century the Khazar Empire extended northward to Kiev and westward to include the Magyars, the ancestors of modern Hungary. In about 740 A.D. a stunning event took place. The Khazars had been under continual pressure from their Byzantine and Moslem neighbors to adopt either Christianity or Islam, but the Khazar ruler, called the Khagan, had heard of a third religion called Judaism. Apparently for political reasons of independence, the Kagan announced that the Khazars were adopting Judaism as their religion. Overnight an entirely new group of people, the warlike Khazars, suddenly proclaimed themselves Jews, adoptive Jews. The Khazar Kingdom began to be described as the Kingdom of the Jews by historians of that day. Succeeding Khazar rulers took Jewish names, and during the late 9th century the Khazar Kingdom became a haven for Jews from other lands. Meanwhile the brutal Khazar domination over other peoples continued unchanged, but then a new factor appeared on the scene. During the 8th century they came coursing down the great rivers, the Dnieper, the Don, the Volga. They were the eastern branch of the Vikings. They were known as the Varangians or as the Rus. Like other Vikings, the Rus were bold adventurers and fierce fighters, but when they tangled with the Khazars, the Rus often ended up paying tribute like everyone else. In the year 862 a Rus leader named Rurik founded the city of Novgorod, and the Russian nation was born. The Rus Vikings settled among the Slavonic tribes under Khazar domination, and the struggle between Vikings and Khazars changed in character. It became a struggle by the emerging nation of Russia for independence from Khazar oppression. Over a century after the founding of Russia's first city, another momentous event took place. Russia's leader, Prince Vladimir of Kiev, accepted baptism as a Christian in the year 989. He actively promoted Christianity in Russia, and his memory is revered by Russians today as Saint Vladimir. And so, a thousand years ago, Russia's tradition as a Christian nation began. Vladimir's conversion also brought Russia into alliance with Byzantium. The Byzantine rulers had always feared the Khazars, and the Russians were still struggling to free themselves. And so in the year 1016, Combined Russian and Byzantine forces attacked the Khazar Kingdom. The Khazar Empire was shattered, and the Kingdom of the Khazars itself fell into decline. Eventually most of the Khazar Jews migrated to other areas. Many of them wound up in Eastern Europe where they mingled and intermarried with other Jews. Like the Semitic Jews some thousand years earlier, the Khazar Jews became dispersed. The kingdom of the Khazars was no more. As they moved and lived among the Jewish people, the Khazar Jews passed on a distinct heritage from generation to generation. One element of the Khazar Jew heritage is a militant form of Zionism. 
In the view of Khazar Jews, the land occupied by ancient Israel is to be retaken not by miracle but by armed force. This is what is meant by Zionism today, and this is the force that created the nation which calls itself Israel today. The other major ingredient of the Khazar Jew heritage is hatred for Christianity and for the Russian people as the champions of the Christian faith. Christianity is viewed as the force which caused the ancient so-called Kingdom of the Jews, the Khazar Kingdom, to collapse. Having once dominated much of what is present-day Russia, the Khazar Jews still want to re-establish that domination, and for a millennium they have been trying continually to do just that. In 1917 the Khazar Jews passed a major milestone toward the creation of their own state in Palestine, as I mentioned last month. That same year they also created the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. There followed a Christian Holocaust, the likes of which the world has never seen. The Khazar Jews were once again in control of Russia after more than 900 years, and they set about the task of destroying Christianity by destroying Christians, over 100 million of them, and at the same time over 20 million religious Jews also died at the hands of the Khazar Jews. This, my friends, is what the Russian Christians were up against in their 60-year struggle to overthrow the atheistic Bolsheviks, but they finally succeeded in their overthrow program, and now the thousand-year-old war between the Russian Christians and the Khazar Jews is reaching a climax. At stake is not only the future of Russia and of Christianity, but also of the Jewish people as a whole. Last month, on August 19, 1979, Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum died in New York. He died in the morning and was buried the same afternoon. Very short notice, and yet some 100,000 Jewish men arrived in time for the funeral. It is hard to imagine how many more hundreds of thousands could not arrive on such short notice. A month later, on September 18, his followers placed a memorial tribute by way of a paid advertisement in the New York Times, and clearly it spoke for many Jews. Among other things it said, quote, He was the undisputed leader of all Jews everywhere who had not been infected by Zionism, unquote. and also, quote, With a courage all too rare in our time, he called the Zionist state a work of Satan, a sacrilege and a blasphemy. The shedding of blood for the sake of the Zionist state was abhorrent to him." Unquote. Those words, my friends, were spoken by Orthodox Jews mourning for their fallen leader, and the new Christian rulers of Russia would agree, for they too regard the Zionist state of Israel as a counterfeit, a cruel and dangerous hoax for Christian and Jew alike. The Khazar state called the Kingdom of the Jews a thousand years ago was a parasite living on the tribute from conquered peoples. Likewise today Israel depends for its survival on a never-ending flow of support from outside. Left unchecked, the Russians believe that the Khazar Jews will destroy Christianity by means of Zionism and Russia through Bolshevism. So Russia's Christian rulers are on the offensive against their enemies of a thousand years, the Khazars. We Americans who call ourselves Christians have not cared enough to open our eyes to try to save our own country or to defend our faith. So now our land has become the battleground of the Christian Russians and their deadly enemies, the Bolsheviks and the Zionists. And like it or not, my friends, we are caught up in this all-out war. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.